Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And when he says we did the Proclaimers last night, we really did the Proclaimers last night. <laughs> and some of you will be able to attest and no doubt will appear on YouTube uh, before too long. Well worth avoiding. Right, um, I, I am not going to be speaking to you uh, as long today as Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> he did an hour and a half. Uh, it, just, it was exactly my journey from home to here, actually. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> And then he, and he wrapped up, fortunately, uh, unfortunately not for good. Um, but I'm going to do two slots, and I'm going to try and keep them snappy, because it's important stuff we're doing today. So uh, just a bit of background. When I, when I first met Nigel in, in 2007 uh, at, uh, at the uh, East India Club over a brace of grouse, as you can imagine, uh, he asked me what I thought of the UKIP brand. And being new to the party and a branding consultant, I told him it was old-fashioned and clunky and outdated. And he agreed. As I became a more active member of the party, I realized a vital thing about the UKIP brand, uh, and that is that it is growing. It was growing. It was becoming better known among the voting public day by day. People were getting to recognize it as we got more TV. We appeared more and more on ballot papers. More people were understanding that UKIP was a real political force that stood for one main thing, which was leaving the EU. We still had a long way to go back then, of course, we had virtually no local councillors and stood at around 2 to 3% in the polls, a position we visited again recently. But Nigel was getting more TV, and we gained 12 MEPs and beaten the Liberals in the 2004 European election, and we had two new members in the House of Lords. Now, one thing you know as a brand consultant is that you never mess around with a brand that is gathering awareness. So now, fast forward to 2016. UKIP has continued to build its brand awareness and become the first new party to win a national election in a century, 27% in the 2014 Euro elections. We took almost 4 million votes in the 2015 general election, which saw the Tories gain an overall majority because we forced them to promise an EU referendum. And then they set about losing it. And then we fought and won the EU referendum, the largest democratic vote ever taken in this country. But by the end of 2016, it was clear that that victory had come at a price. From June onwards, people had been saying to us, congratulations, brilliant job, fantastic result. I expect you'll be packing up now, won't you? In spring 2017, we saw the full horror. In the terrible combination of county elections, affected by the announcement of an imminent snap election called to boast of Mrs May's Brexit mandate, we were comprehensively marmalised. Now, some of our troubles have been of our own making. The post-Farage era was always going to be necessary but difficult. Some of our wounds have undoubtedly been self-inflicted, but the predominant factor has been the widespread belief among the public that UKIP is the party for getting us out of the EU, and that belief being widespread is a victory for us. But the point is, the widespread belief is that we were, we were the party for getting us out of the EU, that we are now getting out of the EU, and UKIP therefore has no purpose. We've heard it on doorsteps throughout the country. Some of our own members, including activists who have distrusted the Tories for decades, voted Tory in June. A million of our voters returned to Labour, believing that Corbyn was a man of principle who would support Brexit. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? it I, I had to remember to put some jokes in. Uh, as I said earlier, you don't mess around with a brand when it's winning, but sometimes the market tells you it's time for change. Brand theory is actually quite simple. A brand is a reason to choose it helps people identify you against the background of your competitors. It's a set of true, clear values and messages represented by a name and a visual symbol, usually, that helps people choose between you and another offering in your market. From 1995, when the UKIP lo pound logo was invented, to 2016, when the country voted for Brexit, the UKIP brand presented a clearly defined promise different from that of every other serious party. Now we've achieved the country's Brexit vote, and it is up to the government to deliver it. Of course, we have to be around to make sure they do. But how do we stay around? 
How do we attract members? How do we attract donor funding? How do we attract votes in by-elections and poll ratings, which are equally important, by the way, when our market think we've done our job? That is why Paul Nuttall, with the NEC's backing, asked me last year, as an ordinary member of the NEC, with experience of branding and a reasonable grasp of what makes the party tick, to conduct a review of the brand ready to relaunch the party at this year's conference. So this is not a preemptive strike by me as an unelected interim leader to redefine the party before the new leader gets their hands on it. My job is not to redefine it. My job is to answer the question, what is UKIP beyond the Brexit mission? Not to change who we are, but to explain it without the easy out of EU slogan. Not to disrespect the logo we love, but to create a new look for the party that tells its past and potential customers that it has a new phase of existence, a continuing mission, and that they ought to consider finding out about it and giving it their support. So, down to business. A brand review means looking very hard at yourself and seeing what you really are, unless it's something awful, in which case you have a different problem. So we needed to answer the questions, why is UKIP still here? What does it stand for? And what is it trying to achieve for me, the voter? We needed to clearly define our mission beyond Brexit in terms that any voter can understand and remember and make us different from the rest. So we started by asking what are UKIP's core differential brand characteristics, what we call in branding our USPs, unique selling points. And we believe that they are these. First of all, UKIP has one fundamental point of difference to the, main, to the other main parties, and that is this. We do not seek power for its own sake. If we did, we would be the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> we do not exist to create political careers, to defeat someone else, or to promote an ideology. We exist to achieve something through disruptive electoral power. We have a mission. If we do not have a mission, we should retire and let the career politicians fight over the trough. Yes? Thank you. Second, we are here to champion causes that others won't, either because they're too scared to or because they've surrendered and are collaborating with each other. These are causes that the political and media classes have deemed to be off limits very often. But UKIP refuses to be gagged by these cowardly conventions or hobbled by political correctness. Do you agree? <laughs> now, the third thing is our causes are not cranky fads, though they are always initially dismissed as such by the political media class. They are things that many ordinary people feel quietly within themselves. They are the common sense issues that seem to be being ignored or suppressed. They are the opinions that if only someone would speak up for them would turn out to have mass popular support. Because if people know what we stand for and 20 to 25% of people say that they will vote for it, things change. Do you agree? Yes. So, that brings us to UKIP's brand values, as we in Loveyland call them. And they are these. We are mission-driven. We are challenging. We are libertarian. It says so in our constitution, and, it's, and it, we should go on being. And we are democratic. So those are our brand values. But what do we stand for politically? Again, I am not trying to invent policy for the new leader, and I'm not going to. What I'm talking about are the core principles we have always stood for that everyone in this party can subscribe to. And we believe that they are these. First of all, we believe in small government. We believe in the idea that the state is the servant of the people and not the other way round. We are patriotic and we believe in the nation state. Yes. We see our nation state as the United Kingdom, perhaps the most successful, successful political union to date. Yes. 
We believe in controlling both the type and levels of immigration into our nation state, and just as importantly, rights to citizenship of it. We believe in an integrated society which preserves our culture and has shared values. And we believe in justice and fairness before the law. It says here, it says here, do you agree? But I think you do. So again, in the language that we lovies would use, our brand positioning, the answer to the question, what does UKIP stand for politically, which makes it different from the others, is this. First of all, and let's be honest about it, UKIP is a nationalist and unionist party. We believe that the nation is a home, a family, and a force for good, where people can belong, be protected, and have the freedom to live their lives as they wish. Everybody knows it. We know it, our opponents know it, the commentators know it, and frequently say it. But for decades now, the left has decreed that it is a bad thing to be called a nationalist. Well, stuff them. <laughs> if it's good enough for the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh and the Cornish, <laughs> and the Catalans, it's good enough for us. And I have to say, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to have roared with laughter at the sight of Nicola Sturgeon tying herself in knots to try and claim that she doesn't want to be called a nationalist because it's a nasty word. <laughs> Second thing, there are three of these. Second thing is UKIP is an integrationist party. We believe that everyone who is or aspires to be British should be fully integrated into British society and respect our British values. <laughs> There should be no alienated minorities. We cannot continue the disastrous experiment in multicultural separation, creating ghettos where our laws and equality standards are ignored. Yeah. We've had enough, ladies and gentlemen, of multiculturalism and division and the self-loathing that has eaten our society from within. People come here from all over the world, not because it's a cultural vacuum or a blank sheet of paper, but because it's a good place to live. <laughs> and the third thing is this. You keep his, as we've said nationalist, we've said integrationist, and the third thing is exceptionalist. Yeah, this is really going to annoy some people. Political scientists get quite excited about this. It's going to annoy perhaps quite a lot of people, but it should seriously cheer up everybody else. Stop and think, when did you last hear anyone in this country say, this is an absolutely excellent country. In fact, it's better than more or less any other you care to name in the world. And I am proud of it. We don't say it, do we? We don't say it. We believe that the UK is a nation which has achieved more than most and contributed more than most to human progress and civilization. We are proud to belong to it and believe it has much more to offer the world. And we're not afraid to say so. Do you agree? Yes. Unfortunately, our country is full of people who think the opposite of this. They think that nationalism and the nation state are outdated and wrong. They think that we don't have a culture worth asking people to ascribe to so they can just bring their own. They think that to believe your country is exceptional is just plain and simple racism. Thank you. And the main problem actually is just that. The wrong people are teaching our children the wrong things. Yeah. You'll forgive me, I'm gonna use this word once. Gramscian Marxist educationalists are teaching our kids that Britain is responsible for all that's wrong in the world and that we must renounce it in order to be redeemed. So we have campaigned for 25 years to get our country's sovereignty back, but there is a danger that we are so demoralized as a nation that we won't be able to cope with the responsibility. 
So UKIP's overall mission post-Brexit is quite simply national revival. Yeah. Yes? We want to regain control of our borders, our immigration rules, and our citizenship. We want to promote British values and revive our national self-confidence. We want to rebuild the UK's position as a great and leading nation in the world. And we want to continue to reform the democratic structures of the country to return power to the people in every way we can. Do you agree? Yeah. That's a relief. And now, I have, uh, I have twice mentioned British values in the past few minutes. As we all know, British values is one of those things that politicians run screaming away from because they get you into trouble and they lead to endless debate which eventually disappears into a welter of subjectivity and recrimination. Perfect territory for UKIP then. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a simple but fair explanation of what we mean by British values. I believe that British values in the context of underpinning our brand positioning and mission, can be summed up in three words. Simple is always good. British values are fundamentally tolerant, democratic, and Christian. Now, tolerance. We've had some arguments about this. When I, when I first uh, unveiled this at the NEC, the, one of them said, oh, we're too bloody tolerant. <laughs> well, maybe, but tolerance is a core British value, widely acknowledged worldwide, even if not always by ourselves, and a key reason why the UK is the destination of choice for so many migrants. Yeah. But we cherish our tolerance and will fight to preserve it. We will not tolerate intolerance. We will not have our tolerance abused or stand by while our tolerance is used to undermine us. We are democratic in that we believe that the people are sovereign, and while we voluntarily lend power to our institutions, the government, the monarchy, the police, we never forget that it belongs to us. We claim, we claim as part of our heritage the mother of all parliaments, Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights, habeas corpus, Peel's principles of policing, even the European Convention on Human Rights, written by British jurists to give the war-ravaged continent some basic starting point on which to rebuild their shattered and traumatized societies, and then idiotically transposed into law by the Blair government, which assumed that we had had no human rights before that, and misused repeatedly by activist judges ever since. The UK has been a world leader in the development of democratic principles. We cut off the head of a king to establish them, and then put his son back onto the throne to prevent them being abused. <laughs> and finally, what, pray, do we mean by Christian? Well, we don't mean that we are all faithful churchgoers, or even private believers in God. What we do mean is that our society has been built on Christian principles including the primary aspirations to be loving, forgiving, peaceful, and just. Now, as you'll appreciate with a bishop in the audience, I'm not going to go too much further on this. But including Christian in our list does not imply any requirement for individual faith, but it reflects the Judeo-Christian classical and Enlightenment origins upon which our laws, our social systems, and our cultural norms have been built over two millennia. Yeah. We are a Christian country, and we intend to stay that way. Yeah. So, what about the brand, I hear you cry? since you really only came here to find out whether all the online rumours were true. Well, what I have been talking about is the brand. It's the important bit of the brand. It is the answer to the existential questions about our future.
But how do we wrap that up into a simple badge that helps people identify us in the political marketplace? We've laid out here a clear popular mission, national revival. It is positive and inclusive, not divisive. It is, however, challenging, controversial, and differentiated. No one else is doing it. The Conservative Party is led by someone who rebranded her own party, her own political heritage, as nasty. I have to say, brand consultants everywhere just fell over at that point. The Liberal Democrats are opposed to more or less every single thing I have said this morning. I can already hear their sound bounce, repugnant, disgusting, should be consigned to the dustbin of history. You can write your own. The Labour Party, well, what can I say? The Corbyn Labour Party is absolutely 100% opposed to everything we say and do. In fact, to our very existence. Some of their stormtroopers on the extreme left would happily see us dead. But what we're talking about here is vital to our survival as a nation, as a people, as a society, as a culture, and as a force for good in the world. It defines clear lines of battle against our enemies, about which I shall say more later in the morning. Yes, but stop blathering and tell us about the logo. First of all, what are we going to be called? Well, contrary to online rumour, we are not dropping UKIP. <laughs> That would be absolute madness. It's what everyone knows us by, a, an incredibly valuable brand property that has taken years to build. And we're not changing our colors. <laughs> because we're known as the purples, and anyway, they are our colors, and they don't confuse us with anyone else. But we do need to change our name in a way. Our logo is the main advertising that voters see from us. John Harvey tells me that when the pound sign was first adopted, it was to provide the logo with a means of communicating something more about us than just the letters UKIP, which have no obvious meaning. The Bolsheviks, he tells me, used the hammer and sickle to do this because their publics were the workers and the peasants, and they could see in the flag that this was for them. Once again, we need to do this. The pound sound sign today is not resonating with today's voters. It resonates well around this hall, but not with the voters. As Nigel said in 2012, it is a campaign medal, not a forward-looking promise. So our logo should now incorporate both our name, UKIP, and a clear explanation of what we are for. The things we've been talking about this morning. A short proposition which tells everyone who sees it, everyone who sees it, what we're about, what kind of party we are, and what our priority is. Our logo should say, UKIP for the nation. Do we have a slide? Thank you. That's what our logo should say. If our logo says that, every time our logo is seen anywhere, on TV, in the papers, on a leaflet, on a corex or a window poster, the audience will get an additional reminder of what we offer them. Then, whenever we're able to control the use of the logo, we will go further and underline this proposition with a strap line which bangs home what we're talking about. Six words, including three superlative adjectives about our country, Great Britain, United Kingdom, sovereign state. Yeah. Yeah. I've often wondered whether if France was actually called Great France, any Frenchman would ever actually never call it Great France. I think it's highly unlikely, don't you? And yet we've had campaigns over the last two terms of government to just make us be called Britain. Let's just be Britain. No, we're Great Britain. Let's talk about it. We are great, we are united, and we are sovereign. <laughs> Is there anything in what I've said this morning which does not represent this party that you know and love? No. Thank you. Anything which... Anything which, anything which the new leader of UKIP to be announced this evening could disagree with or take exception to. Anything which compromises the ability of our new leader to forge new campaigning directions, new policy priorities, new lines of attack for our party. 
Is there? I don't think so. Or does it just encapsulate why this party exists and why it has existed from the beginning? Now, there has been talk, a little talk of fait accompli and a lack of member involvement in this process. First, I would say that we launched a branch consultation paper on the brand back in February and received dozens of responses. I know you didn't all get to see it. Because what was happening was at the time we did it, and we had to do it then, you were all suddenly heads down on these two forthcoming elections. Second, I would remind you, and I'm sorry to say this, but I wrote this in the magazine, this exercise is not designed to sell to you. It is designed to sell to the people who are not you and are not voting for us and not supporting us now, and we want to bring in. And thirdly, it's important that we have an event. It's important that we do a relaunch, that we mark the change, we mark our re-emergence into the political fray with a new resolve, a restated purpose. And to do so, we must signal to the public that there is something new and different about us that they need to reset their view of UKIP. But when it comes to the fun bit, and we have come to the fun bit, let us all share in the fun. Some months ago, we asked six creative designers from within the party to take a very extensive brief containing all of the, the things that I've talked to you about this morning and interpret it as a logo image. Of the many ideas thrown around, three themes really resonated. And in the end, two were chosen. I now go to show them to you. And then I'm going to ask you to vote during the break on which one you think works best for us. Have you all got a little red disc? Right. Well, just inside the expo area, on the left, on the raffle stall, you'll see two red bins with a slot in the top. And each one will have a different logo on the top. And you can go in there during the coffee break and drop your red counter and decide which of those we go forward with. So, first of all, several people came up with the same theme and we have spent a good deal of time developing it to get it right. That theme was the British Lion, and here he is. I have to tell you, while, while he's up, I have to tell you a funny story about him. If you, try, if you actually go and look for illustrations or photographs of, of male lions, Male lions actually only have two facial expressions. One is, I'm half asleep. <laughs> and the other one is, I'm going to eat you. <laughs> so we had to do quite a lot of work with an, with an artist to actually make sure we've got some which is somewhere in between. <laughs> <laughs> he is alert, he is watchful and ready to roar. His mane reflects the shapes of the Union flag. He looks out and forward with energy and purpose. That's the sort of thing that brand consultants write, by the way. Yet alongside that image, another image emerged during this process that really captured the imagination of the team and uh, others when they saw it. It's more abstract, but it is evocative, and this is it. In a modern, in a modern dynamic purple and gold swoosh, UKIP is carried forward with the wind, with the trade winds in its sails. It is positive, elegant, and free with a swashbuckling verve that sums up Britain's new global horizons. Okay. Right, ladies and gentlemen, the fun begins. You can now choose which of these two you think best represents us. During the, during the next half hour's coffee break, put your red token into the ballot bin, which you think represents the right logo. And then, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention? I'm gonna wind down. Just before I stop, and then I would be awfully grateful if you would be back by 11.30 sharp to hear the wonderful Bishop Michael Nazir Ali put flesh on the bones of our claim to be a Christian country and to find out which of these is the winner. Now, just before I go, I just would like to say thank you to Kleiner Jordan for coming along and, um, and enduring a UKIP conference because she is doing an amazing job with her team, and they have founded this themselves and are running it themselves on a shoestring to actually win for all of us what she presented this morning, which is our rightful place 
in the democratic process. And I think we all ought to owe her another round of applause for doing so. Right, ladies and gentlemen, are you all ready to go and vote? Yeah. Off you go.